remind you that extremism in the defense of liberty is no vice. Genius, Travis Cook, back with you once again. And you know, ordinarily on this show, we uh, we discuss conservatism through the lens of whatever the issue of the day is, whatever current events are going on, and and we we spend a lot of time talking about whatever the controversy or the big issue of that day or that week is, and and we kind of bring a conservative mindset to it. But what we don't do all that often here, and I don't think we do it all that often in society either, is that we don't spend a lot of time talking about taking a step back and talking about conservatism in a more philosophical sense, in a deeper sense, from the sense of an overriding worldview, an overriding way of thinking that encompasses all of your life rather than just how you react to the news events of that specific day or week. And as such, I've had a topic in the back of my head now for about four or five weeks that I've wanted to talk about on this show, and and it is more of a deeper philosophical topic than it is uh, on any specific current event, and, and I haven't really known what the best starting point is to, to start that discussion from, and I've kind of put off talking about it, but I wanted to go ahead and do it today. The, the topic is uh, millennials and conservatism. How do we as conservatives, older conservatives especially, how do we get our message out to the millennials? How do we bring them around? How do we bring them into the fold? How do we educate them as to our message and why it's right for them? Uh, and again, I've, I've had a real tough time getting to, to where the starting point is for this. But as I was doing some reading last week, I was, I was taking a look at uh, David Horowitz's new book, The Black Book of the American Left. And uh, he came across a passage, and I came across a passage reading it, that I thought really summed it all up uh, in one paragraph about as well as anything I've ever read. And of course, if, if you're not familiar with who David Horowitz is, he's a man who uh, in his early days, was very much a, an extreme leftist. He was on the new left back in the 1960s, and he was born to, to communist parents, and uh, in the 1960s, he was at the forefront of a lot of the student protests and those sorts of things, and as his life went on, uh, he began to have what he called second thoughts about his political leanings, and after some very dramatic life experiences, over time, he abandoned leftist politics and eventually came over to conservatism. So is it, this book and other books by him were very interesting reads from that perspective. Well, you saw at the top of the program a little quote that I ran across in David Horowitz's book that I thought really would explain or, or help us explain conservatism to these young millennials better than about anything I can think of. I mean, it, it's so often that we in, in the conservative movement have a tendency to dismiss the young people. And especially after these last two elections, I mean, how many times have we said, I've even said it on this show, you know, my God, I can't believe the the young folks voted for Obama like they did. Oh my God, they voted for him a second time? How did that happen? You know, my God, what's wrong with these kids? I've said it too. But when you actually stop and look at it, as we stand here in 2014, an awful lot of those young folks, and they're people who are in their late teens and they voted for Obama, early 20s, mid 20s even, they're starting to have some reservations now. They're starting to have some buyer's remorse. They're starting to have some misgivings. So it seems to me that they're learning a little bit from, frankly, their mistakes of their youth. But as I talk to them, as I, as I read things they write, as I hear from them, I don't see that they've come all the way over to conservatism yet. And they haven't joined with us quite yet. And I know that's a source of frustration for a lot of conservatives, including me. But then when you actually stop and and think back to your own life, for most of us who are, again, older than this generation, I'm in my late 30s. I know some of you watching this show are even older than that. If you really stop and think about it, those of us who are dyed-in-the-wool conservatives who are older than them, did any of us get to conservatism overnight? I think most of us probably did not. 
I talk to a lot of conservatives every day that were liberals in their youth. Or maybe if they weren't liberals, they were moderates. I would say that in my early 20s, that's what I was. I'm not proud of that. But, and I, and I can't even say that I really truly understood political labels such as conservatism or liberalism. Didn't really follow politics all that much. But when I voted, I would vote kind of moderate now that I look back on it today, knowing what I know now. Very few of us actually had that Saul on the road to Damascus moment where we have that flash of light that suddenly puts everything into perspective. For most of us who are conservatives, that never happened. It was more an, a, a situation of life experience bringing us to this point and understanding gradually over time how the world works. So what I'm telling you is that I think these millennials, a lot of them are going through that process now. It's not going to be a sudden flash of light and they understand conservatism and embrace it. Instead, they're going through the life experiences that a lot of us went through in the, the early and, and mid-20s. So what I'm interested in as a conservative is thinking about how can we go through and help speed up that process of gaining wisdom that, that would ordinarily take two or three years. How can we speed up that process and teach them in a way that they embrace conservatism at the earliest possible moment? And that's where I go back to that David Horowitz passage that I, that I put in at the top of the broadcast. When I read that passage, I thought, man, that this sums up, if, if, if I were to talk to someone who is not a conservative, doesn't understand what the label means, doesn't know what anybody's talking about on television when they talk about conservatism, if I had to take that person and sum up for them in one paragraph or less what conservatism means in 2014, that paragraph would be a great starting point for doing it. So what I wanted to do today is I wanted to go through that small passage from David Horowitz. I wanted to deconstruct it, take it out piece by piece, and illustrate for any millennials who are listening what it means and why conservatism going forward is the best road for you. Or for those of you who are already conservatives who are older, I wanted to illustrate for you how you can best make the arguments of these young folks that you're going to encounter. Because right now they're political orphans. They, uh, they're disillusioned with Obama. They were sold this bill of goods and it has not come through. And a lot of them, when you listen to them, are having significant doubts about the idea of government. Well, hey, so are we. We've just always had those doubts. They're just coming around to it. We've always been there. So there's a lot in common between us and these young folks right now. Those the young folks don't quite know it yet. I want to I wanna explore today the idea of how we can highlight that to the young folks. So once again, starting from the point, of that David Horowitz passage, again, in the book, The Black Book of the American Left. If you haven't read this, I highly recommend it. What Horowitz says is this, quoting, to be a conservative is first to understand that there is no solution to the dilemmas of the human condition. Second, it is to understand that to escape these dilemmas, human beings will inevitably embark on desperate redemptions in this life. These redemptions, in turn, will require holy wars to purge the world of demons, of those who do not share their faith and who stand in their way. To remain free beings, we are continually forced to defend ourselves and our breathing space against the efforts of the redeemers to perfect us, against the armies of the saints who are determined to make the world a better place than it can ever be. Let's deconstruct it. Let's take that out piece by piece. First part of that, to be a conservative is first to understand that there is no solution to the dilemmas of the human condition. Think about that for a second. Human beings, the one thing we can all agree on, whether we're conservative, liberal, not political at all, whatever our race, whatever our background is, whatever our socioeconomic status is, the one thing that every single one of us agrees on is that human beings are imperfect. Human beings at an individual level are flawed. Now, those of us who are religious, those of us who are Christians, we believe that that lack of perfection, that amount of being flawed, uh, is traced back to the propensity for human sin. Those who do not, who are not religious or who are not Christians might have another explanation for it, but regardless of how you get there, the one thing that we all understand intrinsically is that human beings are imperfect. That's our starting point. 
But yet, time and again, we are sold a bill of goods by people who are in favor of big government. And yes, Barack Obama was, uh, was tantamount to this, but he's, he's far from the only one who does it. We're told time and again that with just the right amount of government, with a bigger government, with a smarter government, we can overcome the problems that are inherent to humanity. We can solve the problem of poverty. We can solve the problem of crime. We can solve all of these problems that humanity has always run up against. That's what we're told. And if you don't think about it, I understand it can be a pretty attractive concept. But stop and think of it logically for just a second. Human beings are imperfect. On that, we all agree. If human beings are imperfect, then how can a government designed by imperfect human beings with laws that are designed and passed and implemented by imperfect human beings, how can a government full of imperfect human beings solve the problems that are caused by human imperfection? It doesn't make sense. Instead, what we actually see is that most often on most problems, Government, because of the magnification and the multiplication of all of the imperfect human beings that are involved in it, most often makes those problems far worse. Now, don't get me wrong. There's some things the government can do. You know, the government uh, can provide for national defense. It can, it can provide a justice system. You know, it can enforce property rights. Those kind of things. Nobody's disputing that. We're certainly not disputing that. But when you cross the line to then saying that government should run society, government should solve the problem of poverty, government should solve the problem of crime, it doesn't work. And history shows that it never has. It doesn't work because human beings are imperfect. So how can a bunch of imperfect human beings getting together and forming a government, forming laws, forming whatever system you want to, whatever system you want to talk about, how can that overcome the problems that are caused by human imperfection to begin with. They can't. That, that concept right there is the most important key to understanding conservatism. We don't rely philosophically on a government to solve the ills of the world because we know that no government can, no matter how well-intended, no matter how well-planned, no matter uh, what the positive intentions might be, it's impossible. It doesn't work. Okay, going on in, in Horowitz's quote here, the next part of this. Second, it is to understand that to escape these dilemmas, human beings will inevitably embark on desperate redemptions in this life. So we've established, we've established that there's no actual solution to a lot of the overriding dilemmas of the human condition. Humans are what they are. But yet, there's a lot of human beings out there that will inevitably embark on desperate redemptions for those issues in this life. And from a psychological standpoint, it's understandable. Um, doesn't mean I agree with the people that do that, anything but. But, it, but it's understandable because if you don't think of it the right way, if you don't have the proper mindset about it, the realization that there are no actual solutions to most of the huge overriding issues of the human condition. The fact that there are no solutions for those things can be kind of depressing. You know, I, I, I'm always, I always think back to Thomas Sowell, a guy we talk about a lot on this show, and one thing he's, he's written so many times, there are no solutions in life, there are only trade-offs. A lot of people, when they hear that, they either don't want to believe it, or if they do believe it, it kind of depresses them because it makes them feel a little powerless. Well, you are powerless in the sense of correcting humanity or perfecting humanity or overcoming the ills of humanity but what people don't talk about is that you are powerful in terms of correcting your own life in terms of the things that you encounter every day no you cannot solve poverty for the world but you can solve poverty within your own household no you cannot make sure that every child in the world is fed, but you can make sure that your children are fed and educated and taken care of and provided for and that they become productive citizens in society. You are the most important link to doing that. You have a tremendous amount of power. 
The problem is that the hubris and arrogance of human beings, which, which we all fall for sometimes, even me, the hubris and the arrogance of human beings errantly leads us to believe that we can solve problems bigger than us in spite of our many imperfections. We cannot. But you can make an impact on your own life, your own family, maybe your own neighborhood. And if more people did that, then I think we'd see some improvement on the whole. Okay, going on in Horowitz's passage here. These redemptions in turn will require holy wars to purge the world of demons, of those who do not share their faith and who stand in their way. You know, for all the talk of religion in America today, some of those who fight religion the hardest are those who exhibit many of the characteristics of religion in their own approach to life. And I'm not saying religion is a bad thing. I'm a Christian. I, you know, I, I am religious. But I, I see a lot of people on the left that approach their politics almost like religion in that to them the pursuit of a human-made utopia is holy above all else. That the pursuit of resolving humanity's problems as though we actually could is what provides meaning to their lives. Again, I talked earlier about how when some people realize that there are no actual solutions to the overriding issues of humanity, that can be kind of depressing. Well, for a lot of people, the only other alternative is, is, is to try not to realize that and then to instead throw themselves into the idea that we as humanity can overcome all of these ills. Even though we can't, living in that, uh, living in that false reality is more comforting to them than the realization that it's not possible. And I know I'm getting kind of deep and philosophical here, but it, it, it's kind of like, and this may be a bad comparison, I don't know, it, it's kind of like the woman who, who is with the bad boyfriend and he's got all of his problems and maybe he drinks, maybe he does drugs. There's all kinds of issues there, but what she fears more than what he brings to the table is the idea of being completely alone. In her mind, that's worse. I think liberals, many of them exhibit a similar psychological pattern in that even in the face of evidence that shows we cannot overcome these problems, we cannot solve them as humanity, that that realization would be so painful to them that it would make their lives a living hell unless they got in the right mindset for it. Therefore, they go about this crusade and make no mistake, it is a crusade to them. Even if it's not religion in the traditional sense, it is a crusade to them to convert those of us who don't share their faith in man-made humanity for those of us who in their mind stand in the way of the utopia that they're trying to build which we know never can come about their life's work is to either convert us or get rid of us going on to the last part of Horowitz's passage here to remain free beings, we are continually forced to defend ourselves and our breathing space against the efforts of redeemers to perfect us, against the armies of the saints who are determined to make the world a better place than it can ever be. A lot of people don't stop to think about this part of it. A lot of people hear someone say, well, I want to equalize income. I want to take from the rich and give to the downtrodden. And, and on face value, they like the idea. They don't think it through any further than that. But when you actually look at, at history, world history, so many of the most horrific and despotic regimes, Stalin, Hitler, Mao Zedong, the many myriad of dictatorships in South America and Africa over the years, uh, Chavez down in Venezuela when he was alive, the list is countless. So many of those, Castro and Cuba for crying out loud, oh, there's a great one. So many of those regimes started from the idea of correcting the problems of humanity. So many of them started from the idea that this one particular group 
is screwed because this other group has more than they do. And we've got to equalize that. Who's not for equality? And yet what always happens? When you go, when you go trying to take from one group and give to the other, you're always going to run into pushback. We see it on a lesser degree here in America. But you're always going to run into pushback. When you run into pushback, those who are convinced that they are on, the, are on the side of the moral right, those who are convinced that liberalism is morality inherent, they will justify to themselves absolutely anything to bring about their vision of utopia. You know, the one thing I can tell you, and this, this goes beyond politics, this goes beyond conservative and liberal, this goes to every aspect of human life. The human mind, is both fascinating and, and scary in the sense that the human mind can justify to itself absolutely anything that it desires. Whatever a moral code we might have, if we really want something, we'll find a way to rationalize it. Now, that's not pointing at any one group of people. We're human beings. We're all like that. That's part of those imperfections we talked about earlier, right? Liberals are no different. Big government types around the world, your Stalins, your Hitlers, your Chavez's, your Castro's, and the list goes on and on, were no different. They thought or at least convinced themselves and then convinced others that going beyond the bounds of right and wrong was justifiable in order to bring about this utopia that they were pursuing. When we rational people realize utopia can never come about. You know, when people wonder why we fear Barack Obama so much, and liberalism in general, I, I don't want to point this directly at him because this has never been about Obama himself. This has been about the idea of liberalism. And granted, Obama has been the most effective spokesperson for pure left-wing liberalism in America that this generation has seen. There have been others before him, of course, but for this generation of Americans, he, he's, he's, he's been the most effective spokesperson. That's why we fear him so much, because we've seen around the world where liberalism always ends. It always ends with the mass killings. It always ends with the dictatorships. It always ends with the gas ovens unless there's pushback. Now, granted, it's never happened in America to that degree because there's always been a group of people, conservatives, who have been able to push back and say, no, you're not going that far. But every generation or two, an extreme liberal gets into power and they get a bunch of people behind them that believe in what they're selling. And we see it as extremely dangerous. That's been the case of Barack Obama. In closing... Liberals believe it is their job, or maybe, maybe job's not the right word. Liberals believe it is their duty. Maybe that's a better word. And by extension, the duty of the government to solve the problems of humanity, despite the fact that several thousand years of evidence as human beings shows that human beings are woefully inadequate to perform such a task. Conservatives understand the inherent limitations of flawed human beings and therefore the inherent limitations of a large government created by flawed human beings. Instead, we focus on how to work within those natural limitations so that people, flawed as they are, individual people, can maximize the quality of their own lives for themselves and for their families. We're not trying to perfect the world. We're not trying to tell you we can solve poverty. When you go back to the Obamacare debate and, and you hear Obama in the State of the Union address saying, well, those who are saying just repeal Obamacare, you got to tell us what you would replace, us, replace it with. Absolutely not. The reason we're saying no is because we understand government health care can not work. No matter who comes up with it. So we're not going to embrace this idea, this false idea, that government can solve the problem. It cannot. 
And that's why a lot of us, quite frankly, are upset with a lot of George W. Bush's administration and that old compassionate conservative garbage where a lot of them, Karl Rove included, convinced the American people that, well, we can do big government smarter than the Democrats can. No, you can't. We are in favor of limited government because we understand that human beings on their own cannot overcome the inherent issues of humanity. Now, maybe you rely on God a little bit, maybe you can, but that's probably another discussion for another time. In and of ourselves, we can't do it. But what we can do, and I think what we should focus on individually, is not solving the world's problems, is not reducing income inequality, is not trying to bring the world together. No, what we must focus on is what can we do for ourselves? What can we do for our families? What can we do for those close to us? And that's it. Don't worry about the rest of society. And my message for the millennials would be, don't worry about the rest of society. Most of them wouldn't piss on you if you were on fire. That says nothing bad about you. That's just the natural nature of human beings. But likewise, you don't have a responsibility to piss on the rest of society if they're on fire. Look out for you. You know, there's research out, there's some research anyway, that shows that these millennials are a fairly selfish generation, depending on how you define the term. If that's true, then I think there's a lot of appeal that our message should have to them. Because we conservatives, and notice I'm saying conservative and not Republican, we conservatives will never tell you that it's your responsibility to overcome humanity. It's not your, it's not your responsibility to build, to, to build utopia. If you, have health, if you have health coverage, we'll never tell you it's your responsibility to pay for health coverage for someone else. We'll never tell you that. Your responsibility, in our view, is to you. I don't want anything from you. And I'm not going to give you anything. And at the end of the day, isn't that what freedom's all about? That you and I can choose where and when we spend what we've, what we've earned and on what type of things and on what ideas. And if we want to help someone, we can. If we don't, we won't. To whatever degree we want to provide for our families, we will. But we don't need some overriding authority imperfect as all human beings are to tell us where our resources must go to help those that they feel are worthy some of you millennials have started to have some doubts they're not all that different from the doubts a lot of us have had earlier in our lives it takes life experience, it takes a certain degree of wisdom to embrace conservatism. It, when I talk to conservatives, there's so many of them that tell me they were liberals earlier in their lives. But life experience, going out there and making a living, paying your own bills, it, it, had, it had its way of changing your mind. Most of you will get to that point. What I'm interested in is what we can do to make that process happen a little bit quicker. What a great world we would live in. What a great country we would live in if more people who were 25 years old thought and acted and viewed the world as 55-year-olds do. Can you imagine how great that would be? Now, that's kind of a pipe dream. We're never going to get to that point. But it tells you what potential's out there. So hopefully what I did today is a starting point. I know it's very deep. It's very philosophical. There's probably a lot of people that won't truly understand this presentation I've just given. And I don't expect to tell you it has all the answers, but it's the starting point. To these millennials who are having doubts about Obama and liberalism and even the idea of government, there's a lot of common ground with us conservatives. So instead of listening to the media tell you we're all a bunch of racists, we're all a bunch of rich folks, we're all a bunch of sexists, why don't you actually talk to some of us? You might be pleasantly surprised and what you find. This is America's Evil Genius for this week. We will see you next time.